My name is Mark McKenna, and I'm the director of the Notre Dame Technology Ethics Center. Along with my colleague, Elizabeth Reneris, the director of the Notre Dame uh, IBM Technology Ethics Lab, I'm very happy to welcome you to today's installment of our spring speaker series. As those of you uh, who have joined us for our previous talks will recall, this series focuses generally on the role of technology in promoting mis- and disinformation, the ethical problems involved and the technical, legal, and institutional responses that are best suited to the challenges. Today, we're focusing on platform responsibility for online speech, and we're extremely lucky, lucky to have two of the most important voices in that conversation, Daniel Citron and Yale Eisenstadt. Daniel Citron is the inaugural Jefferson Scholars Foundation Shank Pro Distinguished Professor of Law at the University of Virginia School of Law, where she teaches and writes about information, privacy, free expression, and civil rights. She's long been a personal hero of mine and of many others for her critical work championing the interests of people and especially women who are victims of online harassment. She's also a bona fide genius having been named a MacArthur Fellow in 2019 based on her academic and policy work on cyber stalking and sexual privacy. She's also a leading expert on Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, which has been much in the news in recent months and which we'll spend some time talking about today. Yale Eisenstadt is, is a democracy activist and strategist focused on the intersection of technology, democracy, and policy. She has spent 20 years working around the globe on democracy and security issues as a CIA officer, a White House advisor, the global head of elections integrity operations for political advertising at Facebook. And she's been a diplomat, a corporate social responsibility strategist at ExxonMobil and the head of a global risk firm. She's currently a researcher in residence at Beta Lab and was previously a visiting fellow at Cornell Tech's Digital Life Initiative where she focused on technology's effects on discourse and democracy and teaches a multi-university course on tech media and democracy. So thanks uh, Danielle and Yale for being here. Uh, this is uh, really looking forward to this conversation. Um, so I'm gonna start uh, just by uh, with a sort of general background question for uh, give us a little context here. So we framed this session around platform responsibility for online speech. And as you both know really well, this is a topic that's been all over the news and increasingly has a real political valence to it. And I wondered if you both might just give us a little context for why this has become such a major topic. Uh, what's changed or maybe what hasn't changed over the past decade that has really brought this issue to the fore? Is it like an emergent issue because something different is happening online? Are we just paying attention in a different way? Can you just give us a little context for why this has become such a hot question? All right, so I see Yael um, suggesting that I should pop in. So um, when I first started writing about Section 230, it was 2008. And I called for a, a reasonable, like a duty of care that platforms um, should, rather than a free pass that it is now, that when you under filter, so there's a, we're gonna talk about the sort of nitty gritty about Section 230, but what it does is provide a legal shield for the over and under filtering of, of, of online activity or information in the words of the statute. Um, and when I started thinking about these issues, I was seeing cyber mobs target women online in ways that silenced them and made it very difficult to work and keep a job. And so when I call for a duty of care, gosh, was that unpopular. <laughs> 12 years ago, it was like heresy. And I was told by colleagues that I would absolutely be breaking the internet, that it was an absurd notion um, that whatever happened online was all ones and zeros. It was all speech and information should be free. And the idea that platforms would internalize the cost they were externalizing um, was an absurdity, right? And so Mark, you asked like, how has this changed, right? This, this conference, the fact that we're even having a conversation in which we have liberals on the one hand calling for section 230 reform on the grounds that platforms are doing too little filtering. And on the other side of the aisle, conservatives suggesting that that platform 230 needs to be reformed or dismantled because platforms are doing too much filtering and in particular filtering their speech, though empirically that's not been proven to be true. But long story short is that we have a convergence on the idea that Section 230, we should have a conversation about it, right? 
And lawmakers have, um, you know, sort of, as we're seeing these platforms make their tremendous amount of money, and it's really thanks to the business model that's permitted by the fact that we lack comprehensive data privacy law in the United States, right? Um, part of the sort of the pathologies that grow out of it is that not only are platforms uh, immune from responsibility under Section 230, so for the content that they host and enable and facilitate, including crimes and torts um, and all sorts of online activity that is pretty destructive to society, right? They also enjoy complete, in some sense, their business model is unabated, right? Uh, there's only so much the Federal Trade Commission can do with its resources or is willing to do. State AGs are kind of, they try multi-state actions uh, to, to address platforms and their data privacy laws. But it is kind of, I always think of platforms as kind of the wild west. We are scoff laws in the United States. We are uniquely, <laughs> we uniquely have deregulated platforms, both in terms of data privacy and on the content that they host. And so we're now having a moment of reckoning, right? And there's been a lot of, I think, focus on Section 230 because um, it seems to me that lawmakers are unwilling to have the very hard conversation about comprehensive data protection reform. I'm grateful though to have the conversation about Section 230. Um, I often though, um, there's a lot of misunderstandings about what it does, how it operates, um, how it could and should operate its purpose. And so I'm really glad, Mark, that we are having this conversation to dispel some of the myths that around tech policy reform, because I don't want it to get it wrong, <laughs> right? Having worked on this issue for so long, having proposed um, legislative language with Ben Wittes, been writing about it for a really long time with my colleague, Marianne Franks, um, and so I'm excited that we're having the conversation. I don't want us to mess it up. <laughs> so I'm definitely going to ask you about all of those details. I have a number of questions for you about it. Uh, but I do think it's, um, you know, I, I think it's important to get a sense of sort of what's motivating the conversation right now. Because as you say, like you and some other, you know, you know, activists have been focusing on this for a very long time. But right now it has so much oxygen to it. And just understanding where that's coming from, I, because I think that's critical to understanding what people are going to be motivated to do when they actually sit down and try to uh, and try to make these things. So yeah, did you have some thoughts about from your perspective, what's changed and what has put this out there and the, you know, in the forum, I mean, you've got you've seen this from lots of different perspectives. And I wonder if you, you know, have some pr a particular perspective on this. Sure. Um, I actually love this as the opening question. So, I mean, it's interesting, like I was mentioning earlier, Danielle has actually really helped educate me over the years long before I connected with her at all in some of my thinking on this. Um, I come at it from a, just a very different background, right? I come at it from someone who spent most of my life as a civil servant, who spent most of my career without anybody knowing anything about me publicly and just heads down, focusing on protecting our democracy, protecting our security. A lot of my work focused overseas. Um, and so my, when I started shifting towards looking at what was happening in our sort of discourse at home, and I know some people have heard this story before, but there was, it's, I really started seeing that whatever was happening in our information ecosystem and starting to really become this poisonous, I mean, it was creating such a poisonous environment for discourse in the US started to concern me more for our democracy than even foreign extremism and terrorism, which I had been spending my whole career on. And so, whereas I wasn't focused on section 230 or any of the legislative uh, solutions or, or conversations yet, I was focused on what's happening and how do we help fix it? I'm one of those crazy people who loves to jump into the biggest fire in the world and try to see if I can do something about it. And, and someday I hope that I'd rather bake muffins for a living because it just feels less stressful. But I started digging into the issue and started writing and speaking and then Facebook called and I figured, well, if I'm going to walk the walk and really try to figure out how social media is contributing to many of the harms I'm seeing in the world, then I can't say no to this role. But so why do I bring up that whole story? You asked sort of what has changed and why is Section 230 something that people talk about now? I think for those of us who haven't studied it as long as Danielle and who haven't been looking at some of these issues, we know something at the very basic level is wrong with the way 
our information ecosystem is working. A lot of people for a long time have known about some of the issues with cable news and some of the other issues and how polarizing our information ecosystem is, but what's happening on social media, and now especially after January 6th, people don't know what it is maybe, but they know that social media is contributing to an environment where people are creating real harm in the world, whether it's sex traffickers having easier time connecting with young girls or whether it's such an unbelievable spread of elections disinformation that led to the point of people not just storming the Capitol, but truly doing it because they really believed that it was true to stop this deal stuff. So all of those I think creates an environment where people are saying enough how do we realign this environment with what we want to see for our democracy? And to Danielle's point, I'll just wrap up my opening comments with one more thing. One of, for me, what's really frustrating is how many people right now are arguing about who has the right to even talk about these things or well, Section 230 is not important. Antitrust is important. Antitrust isn't important. Data privacy is important. It's all important. There's no one magical wand that's going to suddenly make it this flourishing, lovely online environment that doesn't exploit and manipulate us. But I think we all have a stake in the future of our public health, our democracy, our children's safety. And so we should all have a stake in this conversation. That's great, thank you. All right, so Danielle, um, since you raised it, um, I, I do wanna um, focus a little bit sort of on the, the nuts and bolts of Section 230. I think four years ago, probably most people hadn't even ever heard of it. Um, you know, there's a lot of, as you said, a lot of misunderstanding about it in part, sometimes I think because certain people um, promote that misunderstanding. Um, I think a lot of people's understanding of Section 230 probably in the last year was driven by what they found out that the former president tweeted about it. Um, so I wonder if you could just give us a little bit of a history lesson here about, you know, what, what Section 30 actually is, why it was created, and how it was designed to work. Okay, so we're going to together back up to 1995 um, and talk about um, the problem that lawmakers, at least on the Hill, thought was the internet, which was pornography. And um, there were a number of, of, especially there was a state senator, James Exxon, who thought that we needed to regulate decency online. And he proposed the Communications Decency Act as an amendment to reform that was going on in the telecommunications space. And um, part of his effort was to criminalize the, the, the knowing facilitation of pornography, which is protected speech, right? So the statute, at least the broader aim of the statute was pretty fairly unconstitutional at the go, right? But part of, an, uh, part of the amendment, which was eventually passed, not only criminalized the um, hosting of pornography, which was eventually struck down by the Supreme Court, um, but also a provision, an amendment that was offered by two congressmen, then Congressman Ron Wyden, he's now a U.S. Senator, and Chris Cox. And it was, we had a liberal and a conservative coming together, and they were convinced by tech industry lobbyists and activists that we had been seeing, we had seen just two little small cases, you know, one in the federal district court and the other state court and both from New York, which sent sort of the message that we were gonna, if you were gonna try to filter block offensive speech, that actually you would bear much more responsibility than you would if you did nothing. And to both Cox and Wyden, that seemed pretty absurd, right? If you're gonna try to clean up the internet, then you should um, at the very least not have more responsibility, right? than if you did nothing. And so what they did in, in section 230, and, and I think it's important to be clear about the subtitle, uh, that, that is the title of section 230 is Good Samaritan Blocking and Filtering of Offensive Speech. So what both these Congress people thought they were doing was pitching a story about how online service provider, or then in the statute called interactive computer service providers, would be acting as Good Samaritans. Right, that they would be taking on the job of moderator, right? Because they didn't want to have the overlords, either federal agencies, right, or really powerful cable companies stepping in, 
what they wanted and, and their pitch, and this was very much out of the 1980s philosophy of Silicon Valley, which is information should be free, that self-regulation is good chaos, and that, but we're gonna be guardians of the gate, right? That interactive computer services, the early ISPs, right? AOL, Prodigy, that they would take on the job of being the good Samaritan, of blocking and filtering offensive speech. Remember, I, this is not my words, guys. <laughs> Blocking and filtering of offensive speech was the words of the lawmakers, right? And there are two important provisions that are gonna animate the debates today. So I'm just gonna give you a quick sense of them, right? So section 230 C1, that's, and just, um, so for some shorthand, that's the under filtering provision. And it basically says that we're not gonna treat interactive computer services as the publisher or speaker of information provided by someone else. So the words publishing and speaking that comes from the statute. Okay, but it's not conditioned on any behavior. The only thing that suggests that this is kind of a deal for being a good Samaritan is the title of the statute, right? So this 230C1 basically says that if you are publishing somebody else's speech, we're not gonna treat you as if you are, right? It doesn't say you have to do something to get that legal shield, right? Just the plain words of that provision. So that's the underfiltering clause. Then there's an overfiltering clause, which says if you um, filter or block offensive, harassing, these are the words of statute, and other types of speech, if you do that in good faith, then you also enjoy the legal shield. So those are the two provisions that that liberals are criticizing the C1, the the um, under filtering provision, conservatives are criticizing the over filtering provision in C2. And also it's important to note that there are some things that Congress said don't enjoy the legal shield, right? And that is um, uh, intellectual property law, um, uh, the Electronic Communications Privacy Act um, and federal criminal law explicitly said, look like platforms, if you, if you are a scoff law vis-a-vis intellectual property law or federal criminal law, it's still on you, right? You don't enjoy that legal shield. And more recently, Congress has passed what's called the um, Federal Online Se Sex Crime Trafficking Act, which they thought they were doing another carve out from Section 230. Much like federal criminal law, it turns out the law wasn't well crafted. We tried really hard <laughs> to make sure that it was. I worked, I worked with Senator Harris's office and it's just like a disaster, which we can talk about. But, but um, knowingly facilitating sex trafficking is now, um, is not, it doesn't enjoy the legal shield, thanks to FOSTA. So that's the, so Mark, I hope that's a helpful primer. Uh, no, that's really helpful, you know. especially because I think you hear so much about like, uh, so, mis much, so much misinformation about actually what this law does and you know, what, it, what its purposes are. So yeah, I, um, I wanna turn to you for a second because you, I mean, you've worn a lot of hats over the course of your career, but just for this moment, I wonder if you could put back on your Facebook hat and give us a sense of like how you see the platforms and especially those social media platforms relying on and interpreting uh, the, the significance of section 230. Like, you know, cause I, I hear from some of those platform and, and maybe this is deliberate that uh, them promoting the idea to the world that if they do anything to filter, then they're gonna be treated like publishers. And that's the reason why they can't do that. So I, I wonder if you could give us some insider perspective there. Sure, so it's so interesting. When I was first at Facebook and wasn't as steeped in the debates around all of the different legislative ideas out there and didn't know about Section 230 to the level of detail that I do now, and not nearly to the level of detail that Danielle does. Um, it struck me immediately, and I've written about this a few times, how everything, I mean, even from a very personal perspective, everything that I tried to even discuss while at Facebook, which you would think were sort of very obvious questions, like, hey, why aren't we using the same sort of uh, tools that we're using on the organic content to ensure that we're not allowing for disinformation in political advertising? Or why aren't we making sure that we're scanning ads with the same tools that we're scanning organic content for voter suppression content? Like every question I would ask, what it struck me immediately that all of the responses or all the plans we were building or all the things that were getting approved 
we're always making sure we weren't being proactive. For example, we're speaking to a certain government, I won't say what government, about their upcoming election. And the government tells us these certain things are illegal in our country. This is our elections law. And so we want to make sure that this is not happening on Facebook. And our answers were always very well crafted to say, if you see that content on the platform or in our advertising, please let us know and we will look at it and take it down. It was never, oh, those are your laws. So we will make sure that we're not breaking your laws and we will make sure that we are not taking advertising that violates your election laws. Now, I realize that this is sort of maybe different than what people are thinking about when they think it's Section 230. But what I immediately realized in that moment is we are always making sure that we are not on the hook for proactively ensuring that we are enforcing these countries' laws. And why is that? And the more I started digging there, the more I realized we are not incentivized to do so. We are incentivized to actually do the opposite. Because if we prove that we can do all of these things proactively, then is that sort of arguing for we actually should be taking responsibility for these things? And so I know that's sort of high level, but I just felt like we were never, I'm not saying that Facebook doesn't do a lot to try to combat certain forms of disinformation and that they aren't, there are, there are teams at Facebook that are definitely trying in certain respects. But at the fundamental level, we were never incentivized to be proactive to ensure that these things weren't happening. And I think that is a really fundamental core here because A, we never ever wanted to be accused of being a publisher. We never ever wanted to be accused of, I mean, let's not even say accused. We didn't want the public to think that we actually could clean up certain parts of the platform. And so you'll hear a lot about how it's too hard or there's aren't enough technical solutions or all of these things. I will tell you some of the things that we proposed in our teams were 100% technically feasible and yet they still wouldn't do it. So I also think it sets up a perverse incentive structure when you're saying, if you do the right thing, you're then scared that you're going to be classified as a publisher. So therefore don't do the right thing. I think that's a hugely problematic way of framing this inside the tech platforms. So that's a really good segue because I wanted to ask both of you, um, you know, given these experiences, what's broken? Like what, what are the parts that need, need to be fixed? And I guess one thing I would, I want us to sort of think about as we're talking about that is whether the things that are broken are actually section 230 or are there other things about the, you know, the nature of the platform and the business model? And Daniel, you mentioned earlier, you know, that, you know, that the, the, the way we don't regulate uh, data, you know, gives them uh, the incentive to create a business model that actually pro provides. So it's, so, you know, one possible reaction here is that what's broken is actually not section 230. It's like these other things, but maybe those are harder to fix or maybe, uh, you know, and at Yale, I think you, you know, a lot of what you were describing is sort of about, is about what Facebook wants to look like to the public rather than sort of what's, so, so I guess I want to focus the question on sort of like what's broken that's, that is relevant uh, here to thinking about how we might approach reform to section 230. So I, I think we have a bunch that's broken, right? In part, because it's important to say, you know, these companies have their terms of service are global. Even though you might think, gosh, every country's laws are different, that they should have different terms of service, but it's cheaper and easier for them to have a one, fit, fit, you know, one size fits all model. And they do when press, they know they have to comply with country's laws. And so when press they do, and more recently they've, um, the five biggest providers have signed a memo of understanding agreement uh, about hate speech, in which they're agreeing with the European commission that they'll take down hate speech within 24 hours. So, you know, the, um, it just all back up all of that is to say is that these, you know, the biggest platforms are um, treating uh, much of the wreckage as if it's a one size fits all model. And often it is because um, most of these companies are based in the United States. Um, and if there are efforts to sue them outside of the United States, you know, they've got to bring under the speech act, they have to bring, um, you know, um, findings or adjudications against them to the United States. And under this federal speech act, if it's based on defamation, it has to comply with the First Amendment and Section 230. 
And so in many respects, like we are a scoff law, but we then externalize our laws onto everyone else because so many of these tech giants are located in the United States, right? So the question of like what's broken, there is unfortunately a lot that is broken in the United States. And the first thing of course is, and I, I think Yale is so right to say, you know, the idea that we're pointing fingers at each other and saying it's antitrust, no, it's privacy, no, it's section 230 is almost absurd because they're all problematic. So, so I could not uh, agree more. Um, you know, we, we need to fix all three of them, right? And it's, you know, we bought, this is the deal, the tech industry in the 80s, you know, told the story, both activists and, and lobbyists, and they were often the same people, right? The activists were former business people, right? The, the co-founders of EFF were former businessmen, two of them. And so the message that they sent to DC was deregulate, right? We have a system that is based on different types of way that we looked at things was like cable companies we addressed in one way, media we addressed in another. And the message from Silicon Valley was like, no, we need to deregulate, right? And they and some of the argument that companies made, and I'm just thinking of arguments that Larry Page and Sergey Brown made to state AGs in the late 90s was, you don't need to regulate us, right? With regard to personal data, trust us. We want to, we're not doing any evil, right? Um, we assure you state AGs that there's no reason to bring enforcement actions against us because our theory is we're not being evil. This was before they realized they had to make money and they could just collect and monetize and sell, right? As their, as their business plan. But this is, this is preceding that decision that they made. And then they figure it's much less friction to collect right? And to sell and then say, whoops, <laughs> than it is to charge people up front for subscriptions. So we have a confluence of the fact that we don't often, we don't have a comprehensive data protection law in the United States. We rely on law enforcers um, with regard to their unfair and deceptive practice laws, but it's very catch can how they, we enforce those laws. Um, we have some state laws, but again, it's very procedural. And so we don't have robust protection with regard to privacy. That's So that's our first problem, Mark, right? We've got to do something about that, right? But that doesn't 100% solve the still the problem, which is Section 230, which I think the real problem is not the over-filtering provision because if you, gotta, if you over-filter, you do have to do it in good faith. And also, this is the deal, friends. When someone takes down your speech, where's the cause of action, right? These companies are going to, I think, in part rightfully say, this is our platform. It's like my diner. When I say no shoes, no socks, no, you know, if you don't have them, you out, right? They are going to say it's our platform. So if we don't want your speech, go somewhere else, right? It doesn't mean we shouldn't regulate these companies. But in part, I'm just wondering if you take down someone's speech, how are you going to sue them, right? Without some real creativity and some law that's probably not on your side. Okay. So by my lights, and also there's been some interesting studies about complaints about the over censorship of conservative speech, and it turns out to not really be a real problem, right? I am fascinated and look forward to hearing about empirical studies that show that that's true, but I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if that's in fact a real problem or if it's like some people are engaging in hate speech so their speech is being taken down, okay. Second, what's the real problem with Section 230 then, Mark, you asked, like, how should we fix it? And I think that the under-filtering provision was meant to be a, um, a, a duty-based notion, right? That if you're going to enjoy this legal shield, that you got to do something, right? You got to act like a good Samaritan. I want to bring us back to that original purpose of the statute. I don't want to get rid of it. I want to keep it. I want to condition it on reasonable content moderation practices in the face of clear illegality that causes serious harm, right? I don't want to take it away, but I think it should be a reciprocal deal, right? You're going to get the legal shield. It shouldn't be a freed pass. And as Yael said really well, right now there are perverse incentives to do nothing. If you're making money off of data, why would you ever want to, as Yael says, take it down, <laughs> right? That right. seems crazy to me. So. I think we do have to fix that part. 
Um, and also because the free speech calculus is such that if we don't, truly we see a lot less speech, right? Um, we see a whole lot of chilling of, especially, and this is my new book is about intimate privacy, of when your nude photo is posted online, guess what happens? You retreat, you, you, you withdraw. Um, it, and so we see a whole lot of speech being silenced. I'm not an antitrust person, so Mark, we may need in another session on that, not with me, with yeah. someone else, right? Like, so I'm gonna be quiet now. Um, but, but that's where I think we have some gaps and that we have to fill them with off. Yeah, so yeah, I wanna to turn to you just, but I just wanna make two observations. The first is Daniel, I think, uh, thank you for making the point because I think it's a super important point that these, these things often get pitched as, if you take down my speech, then it's sort of, you're removing speech, but there's never really, there's not enough consideration about the consequences of allowing that speech up for other people's speech, right? That there's like, th th this is speech on both sides, really. And I think that needs to be, needs to be emphasized. I just wanted to highlight it. So yeah, I, I wanted to hear your thoughts too. Sure. And so I'm going to look at it from and everything beyond content moderation. So one of the, the things, um, one of the reasons I care so much about this issue is one of the things I care about a lot is accountability. And to this day, this seems to be really the only industry that continues to just have no accountability for their business decisions, for how they monetize their products, and for the externalities that some of their decisions are causing. And so I'm just gonna bring this down to my thoughts on section 230. And I am very open to being told because I actually admire a lot of your all's thinking if I am crazy on this. But what's, what's interesting to me is it appears to me that it's even not so much about the core intention of section 230 that is the issue to Danielle's point. And I, by the way, have never advocated getting rid of Section 230. But it's how it's being so unbelievably over applied to things that go well beyond content moderation and speech. And those are the issues that I focus on. And I'll just give you one of so many different examples. Um, let's look at January 6th, just because it is such a recent and one that I think really shocked a lot of people. I hate to say this, it did not shock me. Um, I was screaming from the rooftops that this was coming. But yes, we can talk about all the different ways that American society has been polarized. We can talk about all the different ways that um, fear and anger and distrust have always existed. But when I look at, even down to an individual level, let's, let's look at even one individual who was involved. Let's look at the woman who was involved storming the Capitol who very sadly was shot and killed. She was a full-blown QAnon supporter. I only know this because immediately when I found out her name, I did a deep dive into her Twitter feed. A lot of that Twitter feed is gone now because so many people that she was tweeting about have been deplatformed. But my questions are, and, and I believe that these questions would never see the light of day in court because I believe a judge would say section 230 preclude, like I believe Facebook or Twitter's defense would be section 230. My questions aren't, does that woman have the right to believe in QAnon? Does that woman have the right to say certain things on Facebook or Twitter? My question is, did she actually go looking for QAnon content? Or did you recommend certain groups to her because you had inferred enough about her from the data you had been gathering on her? She was a veteran. She was having trouble adjusting to civilian life according to the New York Times piece about her. She wasn't doing incredibly well in her business. I used to run our counter extremism hearts and minds type work along the Somali border. That is 100% the profile of someone who is vulnerable to extremist messaging and to being manipulated and having her emotions exploited. And I know I'm getting really nitty gritty here, but mm -hmm. the point to this is, I, if, if I wanted to try to somehow explore if Facebook had any, or Twitter had any responsibility in what happened on January 6th, I would wanna know, did she, go onto Facebook and Twitter and type in QAnon groups and specifically go looking for them or type in, you know, all the other, some of the other people who've gone into other white supremacy groups or other hate groups, or did your recommendation engines push her towards that? 
Did you possibly connect her with someone through a you two should know each other? Did she plan some of these things on your platform that you knew about and chose not to do anything about it? It's your tools. Was she targeted with any advertisements that were about Stop the Steal or that were actually inviting her to come into groups to do this? Those are the tools. That's not about the speech. That's about the tools. And that's why I cannot accept that we have taken what is Section 230 and applied it to everything as a get out of jail card for the platforms. And yes, I understand there are certain exceptions. Some LA Times columnists tried to tell me I was too stupid to speak about Section 230 and said that I think it frees them of everything. Of course, I understand that when they break federal law, Section 230 doesn't apply, but it's the tools. And these tools are intentional because that is the point. They're hoovering up our data to put us into smaller and smaller boxes to be able to perfect this personalization process to sell us ads. And so I just think it's been this weaponization of the idea of the First Amendment and free speech to give them free pass of every business decision and all of the tools that are causing some of this harm. And that's where I would say rather than completely reforming Section 230, except for some of the really smart ideas of duty and care and whatnot, why are we not thinking also about what applies and what doesn't? And in what categories apply to Section 230? And that's kind of where I focus. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. I think that, um, and just to tie it back to Danielle's point, there's this tension, I think, between on the one hand, the platform's wanting to say with the First Amendment shield, like this is our platform and we can do with it whatever we want. But then also framing much of the discussion about asking them to do more as like, we're, we're just passive here, like right? People post stuff, you know, what can we do, right? And I think, you know, your point is that they're, they actually aren't passive, right? There's a lot of activity that they go in. So let me, let me ask you both. Um, and then I'll, we have a lot of audience questions coming in. So I'll turn to those and ask Elizabeth also to chime in um, when she's uh, ready to. Um, like if, if, if we get down to like nuts and bolts here, Danielle, like um, what, what do you want to do amendment wise? Like what's the language that you want in there? And what do you think of the proposals that are out there right now? I mean, there's like, there's a couple, there's, you know, you know, we were just talking earlier, Marianne's dissatisfaction with one of the proposed bills. So like, what, what do you like about them? What do you not like about them? Like, what do you think is the most important things to the stuff to be in there? Okay, so I, I think just to just to endorse something yeah, Al said, which is, um, and something that Ben Wittes and I kind of underscore and show in our, in our joint work is that courts have, um, the federal courts and state courts in interpreting section 230 have really, um, so over broadly interpreted section 230 so that even sites like arms list that are hubs that put illegal basically gun seller and buyers together and get a cut of the deal that they get to say oh we're just publishing information when that's not at all what they're doing um, and that amazon can sell poisonous goods that kill people and they can say oh we're just you know hosting information right when they're in fact getting a cut of of um sales of goods, right? And so um, I think information must be three was the, the slogan of the 80s. It has been distorted beyond all recognition. Okay, so Mark, your question about, you know, what we should do. And so um, in language that um, I proposed with Ben Wittes um, in 2017, and that I've um, offered to Congress in House testimony in two different committees, is that we should we should amend Section 230C1 to say that um, that um, we, that we should. Uh, I'll, I guess I'll offer the language mark without you know boring us. But the idea of allowing Section 230 um, that you are not going to treat you as a publisher or speaker for someone else's content so long as you engage in and here's the language reasonable content moderation practices in the face of illegality that causes serious harm. And so you don't have to engage in reasonable content moderation practices for things that aren't illegal, right? Or that can't be a, the premise of liability, like for example, hate speech. Um, it would only apply to requiring companies in order to get that legal shield to have engage in reasonable content moderation practices in the face of very specific kinds of illegality that causes harm. And the reason why um, 
I think I'm attracted to reasonable content moderation practice as a way as a way to think about it is because it's elastic, right? Because I've seen by working um, with Facebook on their non-consensual intimate imagery um, task force that what is effective for non-consensual um, pornography is different from what's effective and appropriate for a true threat, and what's a effective and appropriate. Uh, for cyber stalking and for spam, right? They're all different problems. They're all have contextual questions and they should all, they, and what's, what I think is important about reasonableness is that it can evolve, right? That, that there's no standard that's set in stone. And so some of my criticism of proposals, um, and I'm just thinking of a, the Blumenthal um, Graham bill is that, uh, and there are various proposals, but we can't come up with a set of best practices that aren't subject to elastic change. If we could, right, and there's some promise in some of these bills, then, then maybe that, that's a great thing. And I would look to courts as the adjudicator to figure that out because then you can evolve over time. But if it was a federal agency that had competence and that had the funds and resources to do it, that also would be an effective thing, right? Um, there are some bills that are kind of weak sauce. And so Marianne Franks and I at the Cyber Civil Rights Initiative have worked on a number of them. A lot of them are based on, and, and in part, I have always argued that I did in my book, um, Hate Crimes in Cyberspace, that a version of what I often call technological due process is that these platforms should have transparency about their rules, explain why that they ban certain things as they do. Um, Helen Norton and I have done work on hate speech and platforms in 2011. Um, explain why you ban it, what the, you know, the reasons behind it, what constitutes something that you ban, like what is hate speech and give us examples, and then have processes as Yale was saying of accountability. Um, that, you know, if speech is taken down or if it's um, de-emphasized, right, tell your, uh, tell, tell the subscriber, tell the individuals using your platform, and then have mechanisms of challenge and redress, right, or just a, a process of appeal, so to speak. Yeah. So, so most of those um, suggestions are really based on process accountability rather than anything else, Mark. Yeah. So of course, you know that elasticity is precisely what they don't like, right? About that proposal is the idea they want a, they want a specific rule. But I think all of our tort students would be surprised to know that living under a rule of reasonableness is, is too problematic to be applied, right? We've, we apply that, con that concept all over the place, right? That's, that's the basic standard of negligence in tort law. So, yeah, did you have some thoughts about like, you know, what would you like to see in terms of reforming, but your earlier comments suggest to me that some of it is about sort of the interpretation of the breadth of section 230, but did you have other sort of specific things you wanted to uh, highlight? Yeah, um, so I would also, in addition to what we've discussed, I, I, and I'm not saying I have the legal solution for exactly what the wording would be to get this done, but I would like us to also start separating their tools for what they do with speech a little bit from the actual speech that's posted online. And so what I'm curious about is, listen, when this was written in 1995, 96, nobody, well, I shouldn't say nobody. I suspect most of us did not envision a Facebook the way it is today. Um, what I can't understand is why are we still giving the same protection to a company for the way they curate, amplify, and recommend content. And I'm not saying, I want to be really clear, I'm not saying therefore we know Facebook is guilty because they recommended somebody to something. What I'm saying is why doesn't a victim even get their day in court to find out if they are guilty? Why can't we even get to discovery? Like let, let's say it's a case about a underage girl and a sex trafficker, or maybe I shouldn't use sex trafficking because then there's the whole fossil thing. Let's look at a different example. But let's look at an example where the tools were the ones that facilitated this connection by recommending someone into a group or by connecting two people who then ended up committing a crime together or by promoting like weapon sales to people and whatever it is, but it's actually your tools. It has nothing to do with just what speech somebody posts. And then why should the victim of that crime not get to have their day in court and Facebook actually have to prove we weren't actually the ones who recommended, they went looking for it. And, and so why can't we even get to that discovery phase? I would like us to separate out some of the tools and maybe part of it is creating a new category for digital curators or of course above a certain threshold. Of course, I'm not trying to kill off all the new startups 
and some sort of new category. And then within that category, you have to define the rules for what is the transparency requirements around your tools, who has oversight over them. What it, it, it's just that we are lumping it all into one fair swoop of section 230. And so I'd like to see some of the amplification and recommendation engines and tools. And, and the funny part is a lot of that goes to Danielle's original point of if we had comprehensive data privacy laws, which is not my expertise, a lot of those tools wouldn't actually be able to exist the way they do right now anyway. Yeah, before I, there's a, a whole bunch of questions in here that are about that, basically about whether reintroducing some more friction into these systems would actually solve some of these problems. But before I turn to any of those, Elizabeth, did you have some questions you want to ask before I start going to the audience question? Yeah, you've actually covered a lot of them um, and the discussion has touched on many of them, but I think one that's really important to address um, when we talk about impediments to justice around these issues is the notion of harm. Um, so you've both alluded to or directly referenced a number of harms that we can point to as a result of um, things that we're viewing through the lens of mis and disinformation. But as a lawyer, one of the frustrations I've had are the, the legal impediments that we've imposed. Um, and uh, Professor Citron, I know you've written a piece recently on privacy harms. And I was hoping you might speak to um, the way that we think about harm uh, in the legal context, specifically the tensions between uh, individualized um, micro harms and then the impact of those harms on society um, at scale and how those are perhaps... Um, uh, the relationship between the notion of harm and the role of Section 230 in limiting sort of access to justice in this space. Yeah, so even, even imagine if we could sue companies, we have, we have a big problem in our legal imagination for our understandings of privacy harms. Um, and often they're so cramped that they are, we only recognize privacy harms that relate to like money damages, meaning financial harm. So you're, you're a victim of identity theft and you're, um, you have charges now on your credit card and you, there are all sorts of like real tangible, you know, quantifiable harms that relate to economic costs. Courts will say, that's a privacy harm when in fact, you know, that wasn't what Warren and Brandeis were thinking about at all. We often don't think about financial harm as tantamount to the emotional harm that actually animated some of the early, I think important, you know, the development of privacy tort law, certainly. Um, but we have such an unnuanced view of what counts as a privacy harm that even if you can get yourself in court, right, you often, um, you, your, the, your ability to sue is so cramped uh, because you've got to show that you have um, not even mitigated harm because that doesn't even count, risk doesn't count, right? your increased risk of being a subject to identity theft, your emotional harm, discrimination harms, right? You're being treated uh, on an unfair basis based on your data. Um, we just don't count those, right? So, so your autonomy harms, control harms, we don't even think about that as harm. And so, there's so much work to do, right? But, but courts um, really often wrestle with understanding the nature of the wrong, which is the activity, right? As well as the harm. And they, in fact, courts will impose harm requirements even when statutes don't have them and include them. So it's absurd, <laughs> right? Um, and statutes for that reason, they're really deterrence minded. Um, and there's a reason why the lawmakers didn't include a harm requirement and courts are like, oh, we got to include a harm requirement here. Um, and that's like an additional absurdity. So we, we have some challenges, right? Um, and it, it, it included in that is understanding how we conceptualize what constitutes a privacy harm. Um, and that's gonna require a bunch of education for courts. Thank you so much. And I'd love to touch on that with Yala as well in terms of what we count. Um, so I think in any conversation about ethics in this space, we have to think about values and competing values. And Yale, I know in your TED talk, you know, you talk about this, this tension between friction and virality or, you know, the way that the tools are engineered um, and then the values that we want to promote in a democratic society. And how, how do you think about those in this context of, um, you know, the, the trade-offs that, that are at play when we think about leveraging 230 for, uh, as you said, as a, a get out of free jail card versus the values that we should be promoting for the sake of our democratic institutions and, and processes? 
So that's where we actually, thanks for that question. I mean, cause that's where I'm gonna get a little more high level coming from first principles type talk, right? Who do we wanna be as a society? Like, what do we want our democracy to look like? Do we want a democracy where information, it's just free first and fast wins the game every single time? Or do we want an environment where we do know how to at least distill fact from fiction? We can completely disagree. But do we want an environment where, first of all, our voices truly are equal? Because don't forget, every single day Facebook makes a decision on whose voices are being amplified and whose are being pushed further down. They will say it's their algorithms that are making those decisions. Don't forget their algorithms at its outset is coded by a human being and it's coded with a goal in mind. And if the goal of that algorithm is to increase engagement, we see where that leads us. So I just want to I know that's sort of an aside, but I want to make that really clear. And if we decide as a society that in order to protect our democracy, we do want to get to a point where we do at least have an information ecosystem with some checks and balances in it, then we need to figure out what that looks like. I think part of the problem was we're picking so much at laws that are outdated and trying to just figure out whether they're good or bad, as opposed to here's the environment today and what do we want that to look like? And I know that's very high level, but that's sort of some of the conversations I would love to see. And I think one of the biggest issues is that free, fast and first is such a tech way of thinking about things. Everybody's information should be free all the time. Okay, I, I, I understand that. I want everyone to have equal access to information. So it being free gives equal access. But at the end of the day, you also want to know that people who actually their craft and their experience and their expertise is what makes them a journalist or what makes them an authoritative figure on something. And they can't do all that for free. Like their lives cannot just be a public service and not pay rent because they're an authoritative figure on a certain subject. So the free thing is one of the issues. Fast, sound bites, click, like everything has to be distilled down to zero nuance. And then it's the frictionless virality thing. It's if you are fast and you are salacious and there's no way to even stop for a second and check your emotional reaction to something. It's, it's everything about this is such a tech solution while losing sight of, but what makes us human and what makes a democracy thrive? And I know this is a really high level answer, but I feel like that gets so lost in some of these conversations and no offense to anybody on this panel, but it's it gets so taken over by the technologists and the lawyers sometimes that I feel like I'm screaming from the table to say, but wait a minute. Also, like, what does it take for democracy to thrive? And by the way, democracy also means protecting the most vulnerable. And who are the most vulnerable in our current social media world? And why aren't we protecting them? And so all of these things, I keep trying to bring it back to this high level if we can figure that out, then can we build in the laws to protect what used to be a public square, as opposed to trying to constantly fight over things that were written to benefit the tech industry? Yeah, I think what's really powerful about this is connecting the very uh, technical and granular solutions with, at the same time, holding this bigger vision of what is the society that we want I think we need both at the same time. Um, and so I think that's why the work that you two in particular do is so critical in this conversation. Um, I know we have a ton of questions from the audience, Mark, so maybe you want to turn to those. Well, yeah, I mean, actually, some of these answers, I think, were really highly relevant to those questions. So I'm, I'm going to uh, make an attempt to kind of weave a few of them together since we only have a few minutes left. And, left, and it's, I think it picks up very nicely, uh, Yale, on your, on your last comment, which is that... Um, so it's really big and complicated, right? There's a lot of problems and it's messy. Um, and sometimes people react to that by saying, so really most of this problem is actually not about section 230, right? As if that, and, and so, and that's meant to be defensive about like, you have a lot of concerns, a lot of legitimate uh, concerns, even a lot of, about the internet, but they're not really about 230. They're about other kinds of things, right? Maybe they're about privacy or maybe they're about, you know, about the business models and maybe they need to be broken up or something like that. Uh, but at the same time, you also see like, you know, uh, maybe as Danielle was talking about earlier, the sort of the different political valence to Section 230, kind of depending on where you're coming from, that it sort of sometimes seems like it takes up all the oxygen, 
because certain people are sort of promoting it. So I guess what I, what I want to ask is sort of um, how do we navigate, like what is the role for section 230 and fixing some of these problems and how do you do that while acknowledging that it's just one piece of a very big puzzle? Who would you like, Mark, tell us who should go first? Well, I'd like to hear both of you, but Daniel, why don't you go first since I, uh, since I was picking it. So, so I think that, you know, as we think about commitments, you know, values that we hold dear, um, the reason why I've, I've long focused on intimate privacy is because it's so central to figuring out not only who we are, but giving us the space to to form close relationships and love relationships and, and to have a sort of equal opportunities as well, because often um, our bodies are who's really counted against is, is women and minorities. And so as we think about the kinds of values that we prioritize, I think we have forgotten how important privacy is to self-development, to love, right? And, and to democracy, because if you have voices that aren't participating, right, it's just a sad, you know, it's a, it's a really desiccated kind of public square, right, a public conversation. And so I'd like us to make sure that as we prioritize values, that what we often lose in this um, information must be free conversation is that not only does that suck all the energy out of the room and, and cut out the harm to speech that exists, which is when you're under online assault or you face an invasion of intimate privacy, you are, your voice is often silenced. And so we're gonna miss those folks in the democratic conversation. And that without intimate privacy, we're almost, we, we have no choice but to use a lot of these tools and it's gonna be most costly to women and minorities. And so we need as a matter of both as, a, as an agenda for a more equal and just society, privacy, intimate privacy has to be foremost right? And equality, understanding privacy as a civil right, as implicating equality, right? And, and, and equal opportunities is so important. And so, you know, you asked Mark, like, what values, like, what should be foremost in our mind that we requires protecting? And I think Section 230 reform helps get us there to a more just society, um, more privacy protecting, um, and so 230 is but part of a broader set of commitments we have to have. I'll go real quick because I know we're at time. Um, I'll just add in addition to that. Again, I think we're sophisticated. We should be a sophisticated enough democracy that we can look at more than one thing at a time. I think uh, there's some very, you, you should really question the interests behind the people who will immediately knock down the idea that any one of these different areas is not relevant. Mm -hmm. um, so in addition to what Danielle said, I fundamentally believe we have to bake accountability into how platforms are steering society because until we do, they know they have a free pass and they are the only industry that knows they have a free pass. And it doesn't mean that there aren't many people in that industry who are trying very hard to do the right thing, but at the top levels, they know they have a free pass. And is that the society we want where a certain section of our society, just because they're in tech and just because they're extraordinarily wealthy and powerful are not accountable to the people that they might actually be harming. So that's why I do think, I don't look at section 230 from the lens of content moderation. I look about, I, again, about building accountability into their actions and intentional choices that they make. Well, that is a really wonderful end because I was just going to say that I really hope that uh, um, all of you will, will join us next time. Uh, our next speaker in this series is Siva Vadianathan, and Siva is uh, going to give a nice provocative talk called Fa The Problem with Facebook is Facebook. Uh, <laughs> so that'll be a really great segue from it. Anyway, th thank you, Danielle and Yale, for coming. It's uh, always great to talk to you guys, and it was really uh, a great conversation. I think everybody learned a lot from it. Um, I hope you guys will come and join us again. Um, maybe we'll be able to do it in person even uh, sometime in the near future.